Hello, my name is Joseph M. Um, I'm from King's College London. I'm delighted that you organized and selected my talk entitled Protein Structural Consequences of DNA Mutational Signatures, a Meta-Analysis of Somatic Variants and Deep Mutational Scanning Data. I'd like to start off by considering um, causes of mutations, which is something that is not sufficiently explored, I'd say, in a lot of um, work in this area. Um, this has historically been something difficult to analyze. However, the um, discovery of mutational signatures in the cancer genomics field really bring this to the forefront of many people's minds. Um, so, so for those of you who are not particularly familiar with um, cancer mutational signatures, the idea is if you consider um, substitutions of DNA at the position which is substituted, if we also take into account the nucleotide 3 prime and 5 prime to the um, substitution, you would then end up with these trinucleotide DNA motifs. A collection of these motifs form a signature, which are in turn found associated with certain mutagenic exposure. So just to give an example here, um, we have a mutational signature. The x-axis are these trinucleotide motifs. Um, the y-axis are the abundance of these motifs. And in this case, we have a predominance of C2T mutations that occur in CG mutational context. So these are spontaneous um, substitutions, the abundance of which correlated with age, and hence they are known as the aging signature. Now similarly, um, with other signatures, what we could then do is, given what we observe from, for example, a tumor, we can then break it down to the contribution of different mutational processes. So hence, um, these signatures could be viewed of as a tool to understand the causes of different mutational um, events that you observe in the tumor. Now, um, our question that I'm interested in is whether there is a link between causes of mutations, so these mutational signatures, with particular consequences that they pose to the cell. Now, this is obviously a big biological question, and here um, I just like to focus on protein coding segment of the genome, which is something that we have a lot more annotation and knowledge on. Now, when we talk about proteins, what we typically have um, is a protein sequence, amino acid sequence, in this case, an example of the human P10 protein. Um, based on the amino acids, we can group them by their physical chemical characteristics. And as you can see right here, that the distribution of different amino acid types along the sequence is not necessarily random or even. And that's because um, each protein has a different protein 3D fold. And this structural feature uh, limits the type of amino acids which are allowed at different positions. So for example, if we group um, the positions by whether they are exposed to the solvent on the surface of the protein or buried in the core of the protein, you can clearly see that in the core, there's a clear preference of hydrophobic and aromatic residues, whereas on the surface, this is where the charged positions um, tend to be found. Now this is important in um, mapping mutational signature because what we do is to look into the protein sequence, consider the corresponding DNA coding sequence, and look for these trinucleotide motifs found um, associated with mutational processes. Now, depending on where they are mapped, um, they could affect only one codon or tandem codons. Now, but regardless of this, this seems to tell us that protein structure is a constraint as to the type of amino acids allowed at different positions. This in turn brings about uneven distribution of codons and therefore an uneven distribution of the DNA motifs available as substrates to different mutational processes that they could target. Now, if we think that this is sensible, then that leads to the question where can we have mutational processes which target motifs that are preferentially on the surface or in the core of the protein? Now, linking what we observe as DNA substitutions to protein um, structural features is important because where they are in the protein could inform us possible consequences. So, for example, if they're in the core of the protein and introduce a dramatic change, we can imagine the protein being destabilized and could easily misfold. Whereas if it's on the surface and target a particular site of interaction, then you're not compromising that much the st stability of the protein. 
but you are instead specifically rewiring a particular segment of the molecular interactome. So using structure, we can then build interpretable explanation as to the possible consequence of a mutation. In this work, what we are considering are six mutational signatures. Each of them have clear preference as to the types of DNA motifs they are targeting. These signatures cover some exogenous exposure. So for example, exposure towards UV radiation, endogenous um, mutational processes such as aging, and some enzymes which generate um, sequence-specific mutations on the DNA. And also signatures associated with drugs. So both 5-FV and platinum, they are um, in DNA intercalating agents used in chemotherapy of tumors. And in each of these cases, tend to be associated with mutations that occur in a particular DNA sequence context. The first question we ask is, out of all these six mutational signatures, are there patterns that a particular signature is found enriched in mutations targeting a particular protein structural region? Now, knowing which amino acid position is in the core, on the surface, or on the interacting interface of proteins, we can then ask, Given the size of these regions and the amount of mutations in this signature which are found in these regions, are they over or underrepresented? Now, looking at this enrichment data, it seems that on the protein surface across all the six signatures, you don't seem to find a particular pattern of over or under um, representation. Whereas in the protein corner interacting interface, it seems that regardless of what signatures you are looking at, there is a tendency that they are found depleted in these regions. We next ask the question, is it because the protein core and interacting interface, there are less motifs available? It seems not if you look at the amount of motifs available in each of these regions. So this seems to tell us that all of these six signature signatures tend to be avoiding the protein core and interacting interface. We found further that if we group mutations by where they are in the protein structure and what type of amino acids the wild type and mutant amino acids are, we can see different patterns in terms of the um, observed amino acid substitution profile. The core tends to favor a lot of substitutions amongst um, hydrophobic um, residues, whereas in the surface and in the interacting interface, is a lot less pronounced, and instead you have more of other types of um, substitutions, such as those that substitute a positive amino acid to a hydrophilic amino acid. So this seems to tell us that protein structure exerts a limitation as to the profile of amino acid substitutions allowed at a given position. Taking all these together, this seems to tell us that um, there could be a bias in the data which explains what we observed. Now, what I've just shown you are data from the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a database of mutations that you actually observe from tumor samples. Now, in tumors, we always have to bear in mind that um, there is selection going on in that those mutations which are not tolerable to the cell would have been removed prior to it being sampled and sequenced for mutations. And in turn, your observed DNA um, um, mutational profile, that should be overrepresented to mutations which are tolerable or beneficial to the tumor. This could potentially explain why, no matter what signatures we're looking at previously, we see depletion in core and interacting interface, both of which are important regions to the function of the protein. We were then thinking, are there any other data types that we could use that overcome this bias? Uh, one thing we could use would be to consider deep mutational scanning experiments. So these um, tends to measure the impact of every possible amino acid substitution along the protein sequence. So by explicitly sampling these um, supposedly intolerable mutations, this should in theory alleviate the bias that we have. So what we did then is to look into three published experimental deep mutational scanning datasets. They target two different proteins, P10 and NMSH2. In the case of P10, we have two separate assays with the activity and the stability of the protein as readout, respectively. 
This curve shows the um, score, the mutational impact score obtained from the experiment. You always have a major peak that presumably should associate with um, mutations that are not particularly harmful, and a smaller second peak um, with a more negative score indicating these are the real harmful mutations. Now we could further illustrate this point by mapping positions in which you, we observe a TCJ variant, so these are observed human variants, and clean var variants, so those observed clinically and are deemed pathogenic. So in all of these three cases, we can see that in the clean var data set, the um, mutational impact score is always a lot more negative than the TCJ variants, which tend to coincide with the major peak, suggesting that most of these TCJ variants are not particularly harmful to the protein. Now, um, thinking about all this, that means that if you really want to look for um, DNA motifs which are associated with mutational context damaging to the protein, what we should look into is this deep mutational scanning data sets. Um, if we have the mutational impact scores, we can consider um, doing a regression using the DNA signature, the DNA motif, as the covariate. Now, the coefficient of this regression tells us both the strength and the statistical significance of whether a DNA signature is associated with damaging mutational impact. We run this regression separately on six different deep mutational scanning data sets. This includes three experimental data sets that I've just shown you and three additional ones which are entirely computational. So what we did, we ran three uh, variant impact predictors on every single possible amino mean, acid substitutions of roughly 7,000 proteins. What we found was um, four uh, separate DNA motifs which are consistently in all data sets associated with damaging mutational impact. These DNA motifs are not found in the observed cancer mutational signatures because those associated motifs are either not particularly consistent in terms of their association or in some cases tend to be associated with less damaging variant impact. We further found that if we consider the number of TCJ variants observed that are occurring in each of these motif contexts, we found that these damaging mutation motifs tend to be quite rarely mutated in the observed data, whereas these common observed mutational signatures, um, the tumors basically are peppered with mutations that could be attributed to these mutational processes. Suggesting further that we have an undersampling problem of mutations which are truly damaging to the affected protein. Now we further ask these damaging mutational um, um, contexts, what exactly makes them damaging? So shown here are the four um, DNA motifs, um, the wild type and the mutant amino acid, uh, and the widths of these ribbons is proportional to the number of times the substitution is represented in the deep mutation scanning data. Now we could see clear themes in terms of what they are attempting to do in changing the protein sequence. Um, we are changing charge, polarity, and in some cases changing the flexibility of the local protein structural element. We further ask these DNA motifs, where do they tend to be? Are they tend to be in protein surface core interacting interface? And in these four cases, we found that they tend to be in the protein core. So not only they are um, imposing these dramatic changes, they are also putting these changes in the core of the protein, which presumably are not particularly accommodating towards this major changes. So I hope I convinced you that um, using large-scale mutational data collected from biological samples, even though a lot of them are now um, collected using high-throughput methods, they still contain bias towards tolerable variants. So the intolerable variants are still undersampled. We could even consider they are kind of a dark matter of the somatic mutational profile in that they could indeed occur but due to the way we are collecting these mutations, observing these mutations, they tend not to be sampled as much as the other variants. I hope I also convince you that using protein structural information, we could um, formulate arguments, explanations as to why 
these mutations are consequential. I have shown you that those damaging DNA mutational pro uh, motifs, they could um, potentially damage the core of the protein via changing physical chemical and dynamical features. Um, this leads to a lot of interesting um, ideas. So for example, if you are able to design mutational processes that target these motifs, we could potentially overload the tumors with a lot of damaging mutations at the core. This could potentially be exploited as a strategy to target um, these tumors. So I hope you find this work interesting. If you want to read more about that, uh, we have a biochive preprint um, now available online. I'd like to thank Franca, members of the group, and especially to Anna, who generated the protein structural mapping using this work. Thank you.